Hello, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the sandwiches. Um, my name is Cassie. I manage all of our ISVs and partnerships at Redis Labs. Um, I work very closely with Jacques Milan and the greater business development team at Pivotal, particularly with Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, so we're one of your guys' top ISV partners, and we're kind of going around to the different locations throughout North America to let you guys know what we do at Redis Labs, how we work together with you, um, differentiators to open source Redis, um, clients that we're working with, everything like that. Um, so for today, we're just going to start off with a little bit of company background as to what we do, who we are, our experience with Redis, um, and then I'm going to hand it off to Audie, who's my solutions architect, and also kind of doubles as a product manager working particularly with Pivotal on the Bosch integration um, and service broker. Um, so without further ado, I'll get started on who we are. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and assume that most of you guys know what open source Redis is. Um, it's the leader in the in-memory database platforms out there on the market, completely open source. Um, obviously, long-term long experience with Pivotal. Um, we support basically any operational, transactional, or analytical use case. Very popular, arguably one of the top open source databases out there on the mar market in terms of popularity. Um, so what we do at Redis Labs is we have an enterprise grade deployment of open source Redis. Um, so this allows for things like high availability, clustering capabilities, um, security, persistence, X, Y, and Z. So he's going to get into some, some deeper specifics around that along with the demo. Yeah. Thanks, Cassie. Hi, everybody. I'm Adi. Um, so as Cassie mentioned, we now have uh, Redis Enterprise running on top of Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, that gives all the benefits that you guys are probably already aware of when it comes to Cloud Foundry, plus all of the benefits that she mentioned in terms of Redis Enterprise, scalability, availability, durability, all of those illities, and is very simple and easy to use. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys, I think, um, talk a little bit about what architecturally is different about Redis Enterprise from uh, Redis Open Source. So up here, you can see Redis Open Source is kind of the, the basis of our technology, but there's certain places where, because of architectural decisions, i.e. the fact that Redis is single-threaded, or just because of uh, realities around scaling software, there's places that Redis just doesn't grow particularly well. <clears throat> so. What that comes down to is network augmentation, uh, operational augmentation, and all of these different kind of complementary software solutions that we've put together to wrap around Redis. Um, and then everything works on top of a REST API, so everything you see is scriptable. Um, and in the Cloud Foundry implementation, that REST API endpoint is externalized. So you could have an externalized process managing, exporting data, whatever it is that you might want to do. Um, so it's, it's very extensible in that regard. And, and one thing I want to touch on, um, just because I'm not going to spend any specific time talking about it, but I think it's really cool and I think it's something that you guys would find particularly interesting, is if you look at Redis as like memory as a service, and the existing data structures as the same kind of data type primitives that you'd have in any given programming language, modules are essentially classes. So that's why we now have like NeuralNet, TopK, BloomFilter, all of these different things that are traditional like computer science data structures that are very like powerful now running server side with Redis. These are things that traditionally you'd have to do application side. Um, and that's why like, I'm personally very excited to see where this goes because it's opening up a whole new frontier of, of interoperability between applications, Redis, and, and various other components of uh, software development. Um, just to speak a little bit more about kind of the software wrapper on the networking side, it comes down to a proxy and a DNS layer. So the proxy does a lot of the things that you'd expect a proxy to do, i.e. do net, uh, connection aggregation. It also does some things specific to Redis. So you guys are probably familiar with the concept of pipelining, how you can send multiple Redis calls in a, sing a single network hop. The proxy will do that for you behind the scenes. It's also aware of your key space. So this is where the data distribution and sharding happens. And this is what allows us to have multiple Redises that make up the same database from the, from the application perspective. Um, and that gets abstracted over the, the DNS component. So your database has one, DN, one host name and port that's tied to it for the life of it. And you can move it around within the underlying infrastructure and the application updates uh, dynamically to, to point to that. Um, that's actually one of the places where the Cloud Foundry implementation is a little rough, so I don't have that functionality right today to show you guys. Um, but just understand in general, 
Uh, our cluster is running a DNS server. It dynamically updates. So in the event that you do have to move from one node to another, um, that, that gets communicated back via DNS to whatever your application is. Make sense? Um, and then on the operations side, it's largely kind of DBA style tasks. So monitoring, um, uh, database creation, destruction, CRUD operations, various other kind of failover scenarios. Um, and the big kind of differentiator between us and other people who do Redis as a service is that our failover times are significantly faster and much more stable. Um, so in general, failover with open source, say, i.e. Sentinel or, or any of the technologies that are based on top of Sentinel is usually a multi-minute kind of situation, about five, six minutes from what I've seen. With us, I've never seen a failover take longer than about 20 or 30 seconds. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get into the, uh, the demo component of what we're talking about. So here is our software, um, and you it has the uh, host name tied to it. So this is totally just an arbitrary one that I picked because I like blah, blah data. And uh, this is running on top of Cloud Foundry. So you can see it's off of an apps domain. Um, when you install the tile in Ops Manager, it'll register this in the API endpoint. Um, and then this UI allows you to essentially manage the databases that you're going to create through the apps view. So. Going over to the app side, if I go and create a service here, this is going to probably be pretty familiar to you guys. I have various plans. Um, one of the things that, that we'd like to see is, is customizing this and making it easier for the end, end customer to be able to pick whatever plans make sense for their world. Um, but for this example, I'm going to just pick kind of the, the top end one, which is multiple Redises, or multi two Redis masters and two uh, slaves. And, and when I get into kind of the lower level of the tool set, this will start to make a little bit more sense. So I'm going to select this, give it a name. And then I have a couple different apps that I'm going to use just to show you guys. Um, so I'm going to bind this getter and setter paradigm. And what this, oh, wrong button. Um, what this will do is essentially show you guys how you can have a shared data layer into Cloud Foundry based applications. Um, and just to give you a sense over here, this is the database that we just created. And there's all kinds of various configuration options that allow you to scale up or, or grow the database as, as is necessary for the application. So you might start with a fairly simple implementation and then, um, here, let me make this bigger for you guys. Um, you might start with a fairly simple implementation and then you need to scale up to go from like two, Red two Redis masters to four or eight or however many that you need to meet the, the throughput requirement. And the other thing that's particularly cool is this was built out of our database as a service uh, platform. We started as database as a service company and the software was written for that purpose. So everything's multi-tenant and we can have essentially multiple different databases all created via the Cloud Foundry apps view, and you can go in and manage them all in a single management view. Um, and the more databases you have, the more important and valuable this idea becomes, right? So now that these have rebooted, I'm going to go over here, just do tests, and now I can see that test popped up over here. Ta-da! So, Connectivity between two applications. Um, and say now I want to scale this up. All I have to do is go over into here, click Edit. And what was two masters is now four. And each one has a corresponding slave unit. Oh, wait, what? Live demos. OK. So this happens while the application's up. You could be re still receiving live tra traffic, and our proxy layer and the, the abstraction in front of it is going to prevent any downtime from happening. Um, and then the other interface that exists is on the CLI view. So if I SSH to one of the nodes in the deployment, 
I can access our CLI view. And the CLI view is essentially there to manage the relationship between logical and physical. So here we have the physical devices, things that Bosch created um, and that we're running on top of. Here is the database that we created, um, the proxy endpoint. That proxy endpoint can be one or more nodes. Um, so say you have, as, as you guys are probably aware, the first thing that you run into with Redis in terms of, of scaling problems is network bottlenecking. So one of the ways that we solve that is, is make our proxy layer um, scalable out to as many nodes as essentially you need to be able to meet whatever the throughput requirements that you have are. So uh, that could be, in this case, just a single endpoint. Um, in it could be co-located with all of your masters. So you can see we've got masters on node two and node three and node one. So in that case, it would be co-located on all three nodes. Or you could have it just on, all, on top of all of the nodes in the cluster. And these are all just different deployment paradigms that depending on what your application is, um, might make sense. And then down at the bottom are the actual Redis processes themselves. Um, so I'll show you real quick. I've got a master on node one here, which is this Redis 17. So we're starting at a green state. All of our nodes and shards are happy. And if I look for Redis 17, I can find this 16835 process. So if I get rid of that, what happens? We can go back to RL admin and see that it's already detected that it's down and that the replication link is failing. And if we run this again, it's already failed over. And now it's respinning up that process and uh, going in and creating that replication link again. So now you can see we're all back to green again. And this can happen in front of an application. Um, and that application is only going to get a blip of downtime as a result. And if this was a more catastrophic failure where the node had gone down, or in the case of, of PCF specifically, if the node just disappears, which I know occasionally happens where operators are a little too tired and clicking around in the infrastructure layer, um, Bosch will go ahead and recreate the node and the cluster will heal itself. And that's one of the things that we've spent a lot of time to make sure that our two paradigms work together because that's a huge value add for a lot of the people that are using the software at the end. Um, does this all make sense? Do you guys have any questions? No? Cool. Um, let me walk you through a few of the other things um, and then talk a little bit about um, essentially kind of what it is that we want to do with this going forward. So um, Cassie mentioned persistence. We have the same kind of persistence options that exist in open source. We get a little bit more granular. Um, so for high consistency applications, you probably want the, the AOF on every right. For most applications, every second is probably going to be good enough. Um, as well, we have this replica of functionality. So this can allow you to create read replicas. It can allow you to create uh, a read replica in multiple different PCF foundations. And that's one of the things that we want to make cleaner in figuring out how to leverage like the TCP router so that we're actually going through y'all's front door rather than hacking through like the firewall paradigms that exist. Um, and then in the somewhat near future, we're going to have bi-directional replication. On the, the per data type level, we're actually looking at conflict-free resolution data types. Um, and that's, those are all going to be modules that replace the existing data structures in Redis. So that allows you to create a fully geo-distributed single database that you know, can go back and forth. And that's something that we will be having come out in our Redis Enterprise software here in the next few months, I believe. Um, and then we'll push that into the PCF deployment as well. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to show you is um, the, the access control side of it, too. So um, I believe in our next release, we're going to have this integrated with LDAP. Um, and then obviously, the next step would be like UAA. Um, but as companies get bigger and security concerns become more and more important, um, they, you need to be able to provide role-based access control. So this allows you to have multiple different users. Um, and then also on the security side, there's SSL, um, which is not usually a trivial thing for, for applications or for Redis to do. Um, so that's just literally checking a box and providing a certificate, and now you have SSL. And I believe we're, we're short on time, so um, if you guys have any other questions. Um, no? Cool. All right, thanks.
Appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, we have a service broker that's out there right now. Um, we should have the full deployment, hopefully, here in the next couple weeks. Um, we're finishing up the paperwork, basically. The, if you guys are interested, I'm happy to provide you the tile, like the, the RC the tile that we have, um, so you can poke around and kind of play with it. Um, but it should be out on PibNet here pretty soon. So. No. Oh, uh, the Redis protocol is the same. Um, we limit the administrative functionality for security reasons. Um, but if you have something running in open source, you should be able to port it over. Um, and same thing with like library integration. So you guys are pretty pretty big in the Ruby world, or at least you were the last time I was I was talking to the labs group. Um, that uh, like Sidekick runs pretty, pretty natively. Um, there's a couple places where it doesn't leverage clustering particularly well, um, which is more on it. Uh, but, uh, and same thing with like Rescue and the, a lot of the other kind of syntactic sugar Redis libraries. Um, <clears throat> since I do have a little bit more time, one of the things that I can show you is uh, the actual performance side of things. So. Um, this is not the, the million plus operations per second demo. Um, that, that's a different thing that I can show you guys. But uh, the, this is essentially just a, a web benchmark. Um, so the bottleneck here is the fact that Python can only go as fast as Python can go. Um, so if I bind that same database to this one, And actually, I don't know if I pushed, I fixed it. But I don't know if I pushed it up. So I might need to push this one up. Um, And then what I'm going to do once it gets pushed up here is run, are you guys familiar with work, WRK, the like load generation tool? All it's essentially just going to do is create some threads, create some traffic, and it'll make the, our graphs look a little bit more interesting than just a straight line. Um, so I'll bind our demo to this, restart it. Oh, it crashed. Awesome. Live debugging. Oh, it's still going. Durr. <laughs> yeah. So I have a follow-up question. So is it possible for me as a developer to have open source Redis on my dev machine and test things out that way and then go to the Yeah, and if you want to test locally on the enterprise solution, we just put out a Docker container. So you can run the same software on Docker and, and essentially build out cluster topologies with that as well. Um, but yeah, it, there, there's one thing that you have to take into consideration, which is that as you do, as you start leveraging multiple Redis's, if you want transactional operation, be able to use the multi-exec pairing, um, you, you have to be able to have those keys all be on the same shard. And so upstream, the, the proxy is aware of your key name, and it's going to shard based on that. And it's, it's a CRC algorithm you might have uh, noticed when we were looking at the... Uh, at the, the CLI view, there were those like, different hash slot values in there. So there's 4096 different outcomes of the CRC algorithm, and then 
as you add more and more masters, each one's become responsible for smaller and smaller subsets. So if you put curly braces around a subset of the key name, i.e. we're talking about like a user, user colon one, and then like user colon one colon some collection thing that's an associated attribute, um, you put curly braces around user colon one, and now that's all that the proxy is going to look at in terms of hashing. So that guarantees that everything ends up on the same shard. Um, so now that this is up, what? Kind of, yeah. Uh, so let's see. There we go. Okay, so now if we run this, we should get a good. So all this is doing um, is just generating a good and putting like I think 10 x's as the value. Um, but I can then plug this into work. Uh, nope. Okay. So let's do five. Let's do five, and then just plug this in there. Uh, maybe. So now I can go over here. And you can see we've got 150 or so. And then the benchmark ends. So um, to run that again, and we've got less than one millisecond of latency. And so normally, um, when, I, when I'm demoing this to, to prospects, I, we have a tool called Memtier Benchmark, which will push this up to the, the million, million and a half level. Um, and that's tricky to run a CLI tool as, as a Cloud Foundry app. So if you guys have any advice on how to do that, I would appreciate it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so this is essentially kind of the, the state of the affairs as it is. Um, we're doing our first release of it, like I said, here in the next couple of weeks. And we have Schwab as a mutual customer that's already running this. I actually just met with them yesterday, and I'm going to train them on this next week. Um, and then I think there's a few others that we were talking to and trying to, to get up and on on this. So um, really, this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, right? And And... As, as we continue to work together and grow the implementation, I think there's, there's a lot of really cool problems that we can solve together. So, yeah. Any other questions? So you said that the refunctional will be available in a couple of weeks. In terms of like what the PCF file has right now, can you explain kind of what the feature of the stuff you can do over there? Sure. Are, are you, so the question is, uh, what, what, how is this different than the existing? And you're talking about like the pivotal created. So um, in general, it's going to be mostly around the scaling and high availability side of things. Um, so the existing tile, you have a single Redis, right? And, and that's, you can't really grow it to be on that. And Redis being single threaded, um, that becomes limiting very quickly. Um, so as you saw, going from a single Redis to multiple Redis's can be something that's baked into the plan or it's just something that you can change in the admin view. Also, you don't have the admin view, you don't have the CLI view. Um, and we've also done certain things around persistence. So uh, in open source, the master is what's writing to disk. And uh, in the event that say in like AOF, AOF being a transaction log, eventually it's going to get too big, it triggers a rewrite event. That rewrite event blocks running Redis. And if you have a lot of data, that can be a non-trivial amount of time. So with us, the slave is what's writing to disk. And it's also alternating the file lock with the running Redis so that it doesn't block. And there's a lot of other places, too, where we've looked at things that big companies need, like security, like, uh, like scalability and persistence and durability. Um, if you're deployed across a broad enough network scope, we're also like, highly available on the machine level as well. And that's, that's the part that I took a lot of time to make sure worked well with Bosch, because there's a lot of similar paradigms that Bosch has. Um, so 
it's it's going back to that the architecture slide, right? So the the key difference is that you have that wrapper there to help you kind of grow and and treat Redis more as a like professional database, something more on par with the things, the kind of feature sets that you'd find in something like SQL Server or, or the things that companies are relying on, but with the memory as a service lower level paradigm that Redis offers. And then once you start talking about Redis modules and multi-master and all of these kind of different things that will be coming here in the next three to six months or so, that's going to be like if, if Open source is here right now, and, and Redis Enterprise is here. That's going to bring everything up to here, because that, that just opens up a whole new world, essentially. And that's something that I know, based on conversations that I've had with, with you know, high-level people at, at Pivotal, is something that you guys are not wanting to pursue. Um, so that's something that we, we have been focusing on, and we're trying to figure out what's the best way to grow that within the Cloud Foundry paradigm. So any other questions? Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate it.